يشرفني أن أتقدم في الشكر والامتنان إلى الرابطة السورية لعلم الأمراض وللأستاذ الدكتور إياد الشرطي أستاذ الأباء والأبناء ولهيئة التمييز والإبداع التي احتضنت هذا المؤتمر والتي أتاحت لي الفرصة للتقدم ببحثي محبتي وتقديري للسيد الرئيس وللوطن والأمل بمستقبل مشرق متطور الآن سأتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية عن موضوعي So my talk is on clinical implications of the molecular signature in skull-based tumors and I will focus on skull-based meningiomas and on craniopharyngiomas in part 2. So meningiomas, as you know, are the most common primary infracranial tumors and roughly one-third of all meningiomas are located in the skull base. From a neurosurgical perspective, skull-based meningiomas are challenging sometimes because they encase neurovascular structures so resecting these tumors is not always easy and uh, we have to understand the biology of these tumors to better treat them for a long time we didn't really know or understand the molecular biology of meningiomas so what we knew since the 90s is that the majority of meningiomas roughly 60 percent of them have somatic and mutations and about the same number of patients have also monosomy of chromosome 22. In the majority of cases, you would have an overlap of NF2 mutations and the LOH of chromosome 22. And it was until 2013 when two groundbreaking papers came out um, showing that NF2 wild type meningiomas have other mutations like AKT1, smoothing, TRAP7, and um, and KL4. And by now, so roughly five years later, we know that NF2 wild type meningiomas are mainly located in the skull base and they include the mutations like TRAP7, AKT1, smoothing, and, and so on. And these mutations occur in combination. So if you look at this Venn diagram, you will see that. Um, the majority of KL4, AKT1, and PIK3CA mutations co-occur with TRAF7 mutations. So having a skull base meningiomas means that the majority of cases would have a combined um, mutational signature of TRAF7 with AKT1, with KL4, and PIK3CA. And you see here that those mutant cases are mutually exclusive with NF2. So you can't have an NF2 mutation and other mutations like AKT1 or TRAF7. This is very uncommon. On the, other, on the other hand, you have also smooth mutations, as I told you about, and those are mainly olfactory grave uh, growth meningiomas. And those smooth meningiomas, they have, in the majority of cases, only smooth mutation with no overlap with, with TRAF7. So now, what are the clinical implications of these mutations in skull-based meningiomas? One of the implications, for example, is the origin of the meningioma or the location. So, for example, smooth mutant meningiomas are restricted to olfactory growth meningiomas. AKT1 TRAF7 mutants are restricted to olfactory growth meningiomas, tuberculum cellif, planum sphenoidale meningiomas, and also in forum magnum meningiomas. NF2 mutations are more common in the posterior fossa of um, the skull base, and KL4, for example, mutations are common in the basal or in temporal base meningiomas. So you see here a correlation between the molecular status and the location of the meningioma. Also, there is uh, correlations between the mutation status and the histology. And here, mainly KL4 meningiomas are predominantly secretory meningiomas. So they have a secretory subtype, whereas NF2 mutants, for example, they are more fibrous or atypical meningiomas, whereas the rest of the mutations is correlated with the meningothelial uh, histology, in specifically here, AKT1. Other uh, clinical implications are, for example, in anteroskull-based meningiomas, if you compare smooth mutants with AKT1 mutants uh, compared with wild-type cases, so none, so cases with no AKT1 or smooth mutations in anteroskull-based meningiomas, you will see, for example, that patients with AKT1 mutations are significantly younger than those with smooth mutations or wild-type cases. 
So there is a correlation between the mutational status and the clinical phenotype. And also, if you look at other um, other parameters like uh, tumor size, you will see that patients with smooth mutant cases, CRF, like an olfactor probe meningioma, they have a significantly larger tumor size or volume compared to patients who are wild type. So there is a significant correlation between tumor volume and the mutational status of patients with scalp-based meningiomas. And also the outcome of patients with smooth and uh, with smooth and mutant meningiomas. Here you see the red curve in the Kaplan-Meier curve. Those patients have worse progression free survival than patients who are wild type. So having a smooth mutation in a skull-based meningioma means a worse survival of these patients. So we see a clinical impact of these mutations. And if you think that roughly one third of all grade one meningiomas which are located in the skull base will relapse after resection. That means we need a further treatment for those patients. And if you look at this table showing you the response rate of multiple chemotherapies that were given to patients in clinical trials, you will see the response rate in this case is 2.5%, which is really bad, meaning we need a better systemic treatment of patients with meningiomas, even if those are patients are grade one, and especially if they are recurrent or progressive. So that is why we need a better treatment in terms of uh, targeted treatment. For example, this clinical trial um, that is including patients with smoothing, pa with smoothing mutations, and those patients will get targeted treatment with a smoothing inhibitor, bismuticib, for example. AKT1 mutant meningiomas will be given AKT inhibitors NF2 mutations uh, or mutant meningiomas will, give, will be given FAC inhibitors. So treating our patients with targeted treatment will be the future of meningioma treatment, in my, op in, in my opinion. And this is very exciting. And I think we will see the results in a one or two years from now. And I'm very excited to see the data. But for now, we have a couple of case reports showing that um, giving an AKT, AKT inhibitor, like in this uh, multifocal meningioma, this patient had a progressive disease. And you see here within six years, the tumor was progressive and resecting these tumors isn't that easy, especially if they are located in the cavernous sinus. So this patient was given AKT inhibitor because this tumor had an AKT1 mutation. And you see here within two years, one and a half years, that that patient had a stable disease. So that means you will see some response of giving target treatment to those patients. And this is really exciting in, in cases like these where you can help patients not only with surgery, but also with um, adjuvant treatment. So to conclude part one, skull-based meningiomas are predominantly NF2 wild type and they harbor actionable mutations like AKT1, smoothen, or PIK3CA. There are many clinical correlations between mutational signature and skull-based meningiomas and tool features, and there are ongoing clinical trials that are evaluating the efficacy of targeted inhibitors for skull-based meningioma patients. And I'm, I'm sure we will see very exciting results in the next few years. Coming to part one, and here we'll focus on craniopharyngiomas. Craniopharyngiomas are benign primary brain tumors um, of a cellular region. And the same thing with um, as with skull-based meningiomas, resecting craniopharyngioma is not always easy and simple because they are they involve um, they involve like hypothalamus and other or chiasm or they are very close to the chiasm, optic chiasm. So resecting these tumors is not always easy. And if you look at the histology of craniopharyngiomas, you can divide them in two main subtypes, the adamantomatous ACPs and the papillary craniopharyngiomas PCPs. And if uh, you look at the differences between ACPs and PCPs, one of these differences, for example, is that the ACPs, um, the peak incidence of patients is usually pediatric patients, and then after that between 40 and 60, whereas PCPs are mainly common in, in adults um, over 40 years. The ACPs are located supra or infradiaphragmatic, whereas papillary 
are more located supradiaphragmatic. And if you look at calcifications, you will see the calcifications are more common in the ACPs and are very rare in PCPs. And this landmark study showed that papillary craniopharyngiomas harbor very frequently, 95% of PCPs of papillary craniopharyngiomas harbor a BRF mutation, BRF these 600E mutations, so the hotspot mutation that is known in melanomas, whereas ACPs, they don't have the BRF mutation, but on the other side, they have a CTNNB1 mutation um, in 95% of cases, and those mutations are mutually exclusive. So having BRF mutation means you won't have a CTNNB mutation and vice versa. And this is exciting because BRF mutations, as I mentioned before, are common in melanomas and giving patients with the BRF V600E mutation, a BRF MEK inhibitor would, um, would correlate with a dramatic response in patients with melanoma. So the question was, if we give patients with a, with a papillary craniopharyngioma, like in this uh, case of a young adult patient with a PCP, this patient was uh, had a had um, a PCP, um, underwent a subtotal resection, and was given um, combined treatment with the BRAF and MEK inhibitor. And you see here within two weeks some response, and after half a year, the tumor almost disappeared. And if you look into the literature, you will see here um, we uh, summarized that in, in a table that we published a couple of years ago showing uh, patients, six patients with papillary craniopharyngiomas. Um, uh, um, adult patients, they underwent multiple surgeries, radiations, and so on, only one patient who had a biopsy, and those patients were treated with the BRAF and MEK inhibitor, and some and in two cases with a BRAF inhibitor alone, and those patients showed a, a response that was as, astonishing in the majority of cases, and in all cases, and that was the rationale to launch a trial to a phase two uh, study to give uh, patients with um, with the papillary craniopharyngioma to give them after surgery a, a bimorafenib and combimitinib as a BRAF MEK inhibitor over four months, and those patients will be evaluated after that, like using MRI. And I can tell you by now that the results are very encouraging. And uh, some preliminary data was shown a couple of weeks ago showing very nice response of these patients. So. Whenever you have patients with papillary craniopharyngiomas, think that those patients have a BRAF V600E hotspot mutation, and those patients can be given a BRAF MEK inhibitor to treat these tumors. And the ongoing multicenter phase two alliance trial that is uh, that is achieved or um, conducted in the US is now evaluating the efficacy of the dual treatment for PCP patients. So thank you very much for your attention. This year I want to acknowledge my lab and all the people who um, worked with me on that. Shukran lakum jamian lil ihtimam wal isra wa idha ankum ay asila hai rakam hada emaili wa twitter account tabai. Shukran jazilan lakum wa كل التقدير والمحبة لكم جميعاً